Well, good morning, evening, and afternoon to all our online audience members, wherever you may be. My name is Russell Shao. I am the executive director of the Global Taiwan Institute. GTI is a 501c3 think tank dedicated exclusively to Taiwan policy research and related programs based in Washington, D.C. Our mission is to enhance the relationship between the United States and Taiwan and Taiwan with the world by contributing to a more informed discussion about Taiwan and its people. In pursuit of that mission, we have several major core programs. They include a biweekly publication called the Global Taiwan Brief, where we feature timely analysis and informed opinions about Taiwan. We also organize regular public seminars, an annual symposium in the fall. We offer scholarship as well as fellowship opportunities and podcasts and much more. If you're not already subscribed to receive our updates, you may do so by visiting our website at globaltaiwan.org. I'll be remiss if I began today's program without thanking our co-founders, directors, staff, and interns who make all our programs possible. So let's begin today's program. I'm truly delighted to be hosting today's virtual seminar on the future of Hong Kong, implications for Taiwan and US policy. Hong Kong has underground fundamental changes since its retrocession to the People's Republic of China in 1997. The high degree of autonomy that is guaranteed by the SAR's mini constitution, the basic law, has been clearly and systematically eroded as Beijing has asserted itself over it, the SAR and economic and political relations between the two sides have become more integrated over the past 25 years. In 2019, widespread tensions erupted in the SAR after the Beijing backed Hong Kong government introduced a controversial extradition bill that spilled over to popular pro democracy protests. The PRC's National People's Congress in 2020 responded with what was arguably a grossly disproportionate response by imposing the Hong Kong national security law while systematically dismantling the SAR's democratic institution and suppressing free expression. There are growing concerns with the international business community about the implications of these events in Hong Kong. In its 2022 Business Sentiment Survey report released last month, the American Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong noted some striking features. Over 40% are more likely to leave the city from a personal perspective, and over 25% of companies say they are more likely to leave Hong Kong. For countries with interest in East Asia, the developments in Hong Kong have been deeply troubling for their political, security, and economic implications. In Washington, lawmakers have responded by working to impose costs on Beijing for undermining human rights in Hong Kong, to include the use of sanctions of Chinese officials and a non-certification of the SAR's eligibility to be treated separately from the mainland. Perhaps most notably, there's a growing sense of solidarity among pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong and Taiwan, which have enhanced the demonstration effects between the two places. The most real of which is a new wave of Hong Kong immigrants moving to Taiwan starting just two years ago. And just yesterday, at a virtual event in the United States, Taiwan's foreign minister, Joseph Wu, said that the government and people there were watching very closely the events in Hong Kong and underscored how, the, how Beijing's treatment of Hong Kong demonstrated Beijing's lack of trustworthiness. Beijing's behaviors in Hong Kong have clearly not helped to facilitate cross-strait negotiations. Specifically, Beijing's authoritarian behavior in Hong Kong has confirmed many long-held fears about the true meaning of the PRC's one country, two systems approach that it still holds out for Taipei, what former Mr. Wu also called one country, one system now. Yet, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and China remain intimately connected economically. What is the trajectory of these economic ties that once served as a glue for these places, especially after now the passage of the national security law? Has Hong Kong's political fate been determined? Will Taiwan be next, as many fear? What are the policy implications of China's crackdown in Hong Kong for Taiwan and U.S. policy? To address all these issues, we have a superb lineup of speakers, and I'll be briefly introduce them in the order that they will be speaking. Each speaker will provide an opening comment of around 10 minutes each. After all the speakers have spoken, uh, I will uh, then uh, facilitate a discussion uh, amongst the speakers, and we do want to hear from our live audience members. So at any point uh, during today's session, 
you may submit your questions uh, via email at contact at globaltaiwan.org. You can also use the chat function on the YouTube page. Uh, you can also tweet us at Global Taiwan. I will repeat these instructions uh, later in the uh, event. So, uh, the panelists that we have today, uh, first, uh, the first we'll be speaking is Dennis Kwok, who is a senior research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. Dennis was a founding member of the Civic Party in Hong Kong. Um, and he, in 2012, he was elected as the member of the Legislative Council representing the Hong Kong legal profession and elected, re-elected in 2016. Next, we have Richard Bush, who is a non-resident senior fellow in the Center for East Asia Policy Studies at Brookings. Uh, prior to joining Brookings, he worked uh, almost five years as the chairman and managing director of the American Institute in Taiwan. His most recent book, Difficult Choices, Taiwan's Quest for Security and the Good Life, was published in 2021. And perhaps most relevant to our discussion uh, today is his uh, 2016 book, Hong Kong in the Shadow of China, Living with the Leviathan. Next, we have Catherine Hill, who is the Financial Times Greater China Correspondent. Catherine has an extensive career with the Financial Times, first working as a world news editor and Asia editor for um, Financial Times Deutschland. Uh, Catherine later worked um, in, for the Financial Times as, as their Taiwan correspondent, uh, as well as Beijing correspondent and Moscow bureau chief. Uh, last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Ren Wu, who is an associate research fellow uh, and professor in the Institute of Taiwan History at Academia Sinica. Uh, Wu obtained his PhD in political science from the University of Chicago, and his research covers comparative politics Asian nationalism in Taiwan, Okinawa, and Hong Kong, and modern Japanese and Taiwanese political history. He's a longtime active participant in Taiwan social movements, and he also recently received a merit award in commentary writing for a Chinese language piece in the reporter titled, titled For an Unfinished Revolution that supported Hong Kong's protest movements. With that, Dennis, I'll turn it over to you. Well, um... Thank you very much for uh, organizing this talk. Um, I, you know, I've been giving uh, talks on Hong Kong uh, regularly, uh, but increasingly, uh, what I find, Russell, is that um, that uh, people are uh, often trying to see Hong Kong through the Taiwan perspective, or trying to do an analysis of the situation in Taiwan uh, using the Hong Kong experience. Uh, I think that is uh, increasingly. Um, um, relevant as people are worried about the situation and the stability of um, the Taiwan Strait. Um, I mean, I, I think looking looking at now, now that I'm out of Hong Kong, um, it is um, easier for me to, to I, I guess, look at it from a broader, uh, a more historic uh, perspective. Um, Hong Kong's story actually uh, changed, I think, um, uh, really under uh, uh, Xi Jinping's um, uh, after he took to uh, center stage in 2012. Um, some of you may remember that in 2014, the uh, PRC State Council came up with the white paper uh, talking about um, how Beijing can exercise comprehensive jurisdiction uh, over Hong Kong. Um, looking back, that was really the turning point. It wasn't the events in uh, 2019 that which perhaps has hastened the pace of um, uh, the complete takeover uh, by Beijing. Um, it was really 2014 that laid the foundation uh, or um, that Beijing made clear that we actually control everything uh, through this concept of comprehensive jurisdiction, which is completely, by the way, alien to the whole constitutional structure under the basic law and one country, two system. Beijing basically imposed this new uh, um, um, concept saying that we actually control everything. There's no separation of powers, that everything flowed from Beijing and everything flowed back to Beijing. Um, when it comes to not just political events, but the whole societal uh, structure um, is uh, subject to this comprehensive jurisdiction. And um, obviously, uh, in 2019, uh, when the protest started, um, the Taiwanese people, our friends in Taiwan, already uh, uh, took uh, uh, a notice of what's happening. 
and uh, which subsequently uh, delivered the election victory of uh, President Tsai Ing-wen. Uh, I think that the Taiwanese people obviously don't need us um, explain or tell them uh, that, that what's happening in Hong Kong. In fact, the recent events just reconfirm uh, uh, the fear uh, that uh, one country, two system under Beijing's uh, 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 current understanding and concept. Um, the two systems, uh, one being an authoritarian system, one being uh, what was used to be a, a liberal democratic system are basically incompatible. Um, I think the Taiwanese people know that the two system basically cannot coexist because the authoritarian system uh, practiced by Beijing do not respect and will not respect the liberal democratic values held by the Hong Kong people or and indeed uh, the Taiwanese people. If you look at the events that are coming out of Hong Kong now, um, not only has uh, uh, the civil society, uh, a lot of my uh, colleagues are in jail, uh, uh, facing a very long uh, sentence, um, a jail sentence to come. And they are talking about enacting new, uh, more national security laws, uh, more laws that will be coming out of the Hong Kong legislature that will focus on activities such as foreign espionage. Um, they will focus on um, foreign organizations that have roots in Hong Kong or uh, the activities in Hong Kong and uh, laws about fake news. It, it basically tells you the trajectory of Hong Kong is not going to um, uh, change uh, very much. In fact, it will become more and more uh, uh, um, a mainland. It will be, become more and more uh, extreme, if I may put it that way, because the politicians now uh, uh, that are uh, 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 the lawmakers uh, in Hong Kong uh, and the officials, they are as if they are trying to outdo each other in showing their patriotism uh, to Beijing, that um, they are fighting over themselves to uh, fall, to, to toe the line, to uh, show Beijing that they are loyal, that they are patriotic, um, and that a lot of the kind of moderation that came with the, the old system, where there were Democrats, there was civil society, there was a, a media uh, 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 moderating things, and now there's this just all one way. The trajectory is very clear. Um, and, you know, take the most recent example of the zero COVID um, uh, policy uh, in, in Hong Kong. Now, that's killing business. It's been the lockdown has been killing business. A lot of um, uh, uh, international business are, are, are complaining and say, look, we can't do business in this so-called international financial center if you have lockdown and quarantine uh, like that. And because of the recent surge of COVID cases uh, uh, in Hong Kong, that lockdown will become even more uh, uh, draconian. Um, the quarantine uh, and the lockdown policies will be, uh, you know, it will be, uh, we're talking about a, a, maybe a, a mainland style lockdown and mandatory testing. And that will basically uh, uh, drive the international community and business community away. Now, what used to be the case is that uh, when business complain, especially when the international business community complained, the Hong Kong government would listen. The lawmakers will react and they will try to pull the Hong Kong government policy back to kind of a more moderate position. But now there's not even a debate over whether there should be COVID zero policy or there should be a more open policy. It is all one way. And some commentators have even equated um, the, the difference between COVID zero policy and uh, living with COVID uh, as, as, a, as a contest between Chinese ideology and Western ideology, that if you buy into this living with COVID, then you're not really Chinese, that you're not really thinking like a Chinese, that your values are different, that you, if, if you are really a patriotic Chinese, then you really have to uh, subscribe to this COVID zero or zero COVID policy and believe that a lockdown is is necessary. So they have all, almost elevated this whole COVID debate into a uh, 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 ideology um, debate in Hong Kong. Um, so this is the new way of thinking um, from Xi Jinping's uh, point of view. I guess the relevance for our Taiwanese friends is that I've been trying to say that under Xi Jinping, the thinking is very different from previous generations of uh, Chinese leaders. The kind of pragmatism that we 
have seen in the past are uh, out of the window. It is not to say that what they're doing now over Hong Kong is completely irrational. It makes sense. It is rational from their point of view. I mean, Beijing's leaders point of view, because they've made this very cold and I think in the short term correct calculation that you know, we're going to do this to Hong Kong. We're going to impose the national security law. We're going to walk back on the Sino-British Joint Declaration. And what is the international community going to do? They're going to maybe complain. They will condemn. They will impose a, uh, uh, some uh, uh, sanctions. But at the end of the day, we will ride it out. We will ride out this uh, uh, condemnation and sanctions, and the business will stay. Because Wall Street, unlike 20 years ago, Wall Street needs China more than China needs Wall Street. And you know we're now uh, uh, 20 years into the WTO. We don't need to pretend to be a, 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 a respectable or responsible player on the international scene. Um, that's not the case 20 years ago when they still need to put up that kind of image. Uh, now they, they feel that the tables have turned and that's why they feel they could do that to Hong Kong because the, the stakes are very different and they could ride out the risk. Now, of course, um, no one, yeah, including them, foresaw that um, that that COVID will will hit Hong Kong the way it is doing now. Uh, that their COVID uh, zero policy is uh, in fact shooting themselves on the foot. That the Hong Kong is losing its international status, um, not so much exactly because of the national security law, because the businesses don't really care, but it is because of their overall policy that is driving Hong Kong further and further to become a mainland city or worse than a mainland city that is really putting off uh, uh, international businesses. And as I always say that um, Hong Kong is not really an isolated case. If you look at uh, the whole of China's policy, whether it is over uh, Taiwan in the South China Sea, in Tibet, in Xinjiang, uh, the trade sanctions over Australia, the Wolf Warrior diplomacy, the whole uh, of the China uh, policy direction is reflected in the way of how they've treated Hong Kong. And I'm afraid that the same kind of thinking will be applied also to Taiwan. And um, people don't realize how inherently, I think, dangerous and unstable the situation is. Looking at from the Hong Kong lenses, I think outside um, the, the international community still have a certain level of naivety about the intentions of China under Xi Jinping. And we in Hong Kong have experienced it firsthand. And we just want to say that um, that it is really a wake up call for the international community. Thank you. Dennis, thank you so much for that. <clears throat> I think a very compelling um, uh, state of current state of play uh, in, in Hong Kong and what has happened, um, you know, in recent years. Uh, you know, I think the the, the remark, the, the sort of transform the transformation and changes <clears throat> in um, in Beijing's approach that you've highlighted is is very um, important for us to remember, and and I think you know I think moving on right now over to Richard before we get and I would love to be able to get into this and in further in our in our discussion, but you know over to Richard is that you know I think you know this wasn't always static, right? I mean there's sort of an evolution in, in in Beijing's approach to Hong Kong, and I think some of that would be helpful in terms of the getting some more context as to. Um, uh, Beijing's uh, approach to Hong Kong and and how that uh, what implications that may have for for Taiwan. So, Richard, uh, I want to turn it over to you now. Um, thanks very much, Russell. Uh, thanks to GTI for putting on this program. Uh, it's good to see Dr. Wu, Catherine, and Dennis, um, if only virtually. And I'm grateful to Dennis for his uh, really concise and precise update on the current situation. Um, following Russell's guidance, I will outline three key elements of ERC policy towards Taiwan over time, and then, then note the implications of each for Taiwan. These elements are its sort of basic assumptions going in. Uh, second is the constitutional design for Hong Kong. And third is the radicalization of Hong Kong politics after 2010. Now, we know that PRC officials sometimes talk of a Taiwan version of one country, two systems. And the suggestion is that uh, uh, this Taiwan version will be more attractive than what Hong Kong got. Um, they never give any details. It's, it's, uh, it's seductive. It's a, it's a dangle. 
And until we see the details, we can't take the hints at face value. So the best basis for judging the implications of Hong Kong for Taiwan is to examine how one country, two systems was actually applied in Hong Kong. Um, the first uh, element I'm gonna look at is uh, the PRC's initial assumptions 40 years ago when it formulated Hong Kong and Taiwan policy. Uh, the first assumption is that because the people of these two territories were ethnic Chinese, they would be happy to join their cultural brothers and sisters in the PRC. Second, uh, they believe that the power in the power of material interests, um, Taiwan and Hong Kong companies would be eager to benefit from Deng's policies of reform and opening, and so they would politically support um, positive relations with Beijing and unification. Third assumption, Chinese leaders assume that the people in Taiwan and Hong Kong would recognize the PRC's growing power and want to be on the side of the winner. And fourth, Chinese leaders noted at that time that neither Hong Kong nor Taiwan was a democracy. So um, the authorities there could make unification deals over the heads of the people and enforce them. Now, these assumptions were either incorrect at the outset or have been negated over time. Um, most significantly, Taiwan has changed and is now a lively democracy. Um, I sometimes suspect that the PRC actually believes that, the, that Taiwan's political system is not really uh, an authentic democracy, but that's another issue. Um, uh, moving on, Taiwan is that Taiwanese identity versus Chinese identity is very strong, uh, and the business environment in China isn't what it used to be for Taiwan companies. So what's the implication? Uh, in my view, even though the Chinese Communist Party has sometimes shown itself able to adjust to changes in its policy environment, uh, and even though the environment regarding Taiwan has greatly changed in the last 40 years, Beijing has been unwilling to accommodate to that evolution and reshape one country, two systems. As, one, as much as one might, would like them to accommodate to these changes, we should not expect it to do so. Uh, the second element um, that I'm going to look at is the original constitutional design of the Hong Kong system. Um, one slogan of PRC Hong Kong policy was that uh, Hong Kong people would administer Hong Kong. But uh, Beijing soon made it clear that only the right kind of Hong Kong people would be given that responsibility. That is, only patriots, quote unquote, needed to apply. In other words, Beijing's approach to the picking of the chief executive and the composition of the legislative council in Hong Kong was straight out of its Leninist United Front playbook. Specifically, the Hong Kong Basic Law rigged the elections of the chief executive and LegCo so that a politician that China mistrusted could never become chief executive and a political party that it opposed could never win a majority in LegCo. Now, it is important to acknowledge that Beijing agreed with the British in the joint declaration that it would ensure the rule of law, establish an independent judiciary and protect civil and political rights. Uh, and these commitments were included in the basic law and in Hong Kong ordinances. Um, Beijing did not grant these concessions out of the kindness of its heart, but because British nego negotiators tricked them. But that's another delicious story. Um, in addition, we must also acknowledge that Beijing permitted popular elections for some LegCo seats, and by the early 2010s, that share was up to 50%. Um, as a result of these elections, we can estimate that the level of popular support for pan-democratic parties in the 2000s and 2010s was about 60%, a significant majority. Now, why did Beijing rig the electoral system for LegCo and the selection of the chief executive? In my view, it's very simple. Beijing's highest priority was to maintain control over the key levers of power in Hong Kong. To repeat, Beijing's highest priority was to maintain control 
over the key levers of power. So what's the implication of this for Taiwan? I think if there were um, a deal based on one country, two systems for Taiwan, Beijing would insist on a political system in which a politician like Tsai Ing-wen could never become president and a party like the DPP could never gain a majority of the legislative yen. Uh, to satisfy Beijing on this point, a Taiwan would have to go from being a full democracy to a partial democracy. The third element um, that I wanna consider is the intensification or radicalization of Hong Kong politics beginning in the late 2000s. Um, in the basic law, there was a hint that China might be willing to make uh, the electoral system for the chief executive and the legislative council more democratic. Through the 2000s, the pan-democrats became more and more impatient that this reform kept getting delayed. And they used their political freedoms and electoral participation as much as possible to voice their impatience. Um, Making elections more democratic in Hong Kong was particularly important because of the city's power structure. Both political and economic power were highly concentrated. Often the two forms of power were in the hands of uh, the same individuals. Um, and the Hong Kong middle class that had built the city's prosperity was losing confidence that their children's lives would be better than their own. Now in democratic capitalist countries, it is through elections um, that the um, population as a whole can reduce the economic inequality from which they suffer. But because the Hong Kong electoral system was rigged, that corrective mechanism um, didn't exist. And that's all the more reason why the pan-democrats wanted to secure more electoral power and reduce not only the political concentration of power, but also the monopoly and oligopoly power of the tycoons. Um, so, as the middle class became more impatient about elections, the character of Hong Kong's protest culture changed. During the first decade after reversion, demonstrators were willing to conform their protests to guidelines set by the Hong Kong government, and protests were quite peaceful. But during the 2000s, younger, protests were, younger protesters were not so willing to abide by the existing guidelines. Unapproved protests, for example, flash mobs, became increasingly common. And the culmination of this trend was the umbrella movement of uh, the fall of 2014. Um, even before these events, however, leaders in Beijing were growing concerned generally about national security threats. This was an issue that Xi Jinping emphasized once he became general secretary, and he took a number of steps to th strengthen national security. And these steps had an impact on electoral reform in Hong Kong. Um, as uh, a new protest movement broke out in 2019, um, more intense and sometimes more violent than uh, the umbrella movement, um, Beijing decided that it really was losing control and it authorized a severe crackdown. Uh, it also imposed uh, the national security law which effectively negates the political and economic freedoms, plus the rule of law that Beijing had incorporated into the basic law. So China's core commitments in the basic law to Hong Kong people have disappeared. So the implication for Taiwan is obvious. Um, the PRC with its obsession with control, it is, is unlikely to offer a version of one country, two systems uh, that would protect Taiwan's civil and political rights, its rule of law, and its independent judiciary. Even if it did, there's no reason to believe that Beijing would um, continue those commitments in perpetuity. Thank you. Real excellent. Um, thank you so much, Richard. And I, I, I think it's so important, you know, after Dennis, uh, you know, gave us the state of play in terms of what's happening in Hong Kong to sort of get the context. And I think you really um, did that brilliantly in terms of uh, laying out, uh, you know, from the three, uh, the three factors that you uh, examined and, and how we got to where we are now and what implications that has for the future. And, 
and I'm sure we'll we'll get into that uh, even further in our our, our discussion. Uh, but for now, I, I want I want to turn it over to Catherine because I think you know we've talked about the the politics, the policies, but one of the you know as I mentioned at the outset of of today's conversation, one of the glue that has really sort of held it all together to some extent were held out optimism for people in terms of what the future may hold for um, you know um, uh, for for Hong Kong, Taiwan, and and, and China is that sort of the, the economic dynamism that that existed and and and, and has grown significantly. In the last several decades, and I, I wanted to turn it over to you, Catherine, in terms to give us some um, insights from uh, from your coverage of these issues of the economic and, and 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 trade dimensions of of the relationship and where you see that going forward, Catherine. Very much, Russell, and um, uh, thanks to all of you. I'm I'm really honoured to be in in this great company uh, and and uh, getting the opportunity to discuss these issues now. Um, Russell, I think in a way you've given me the most difficult task here because uh, I'm I'm supposed um, to give an outlook and look ahead uh, at economic and trade relations between uh, China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. But um, uh, to really understand where we might be going, I think we need to first uh, uh, take a brief look back. And and um, uh, when I say this is this may be the most difficult task, this is because it's. Um, trade relations in this triangular relationship are uh, have been complex and, and really intransparent ever since trade and investment between China and Taiwan uh, took off in the uh, 1980s. Um, uh, why am I saying that? This is because uh, some of the main actors, which is the Taiwanese investors in China, they were bent on uh, at least to some extent hiding uh, what they were doing. In the early years, you know, the, their activity was not yet legal under Taiwanese law. Then later it became legal, but with limits. So uh, that has, for a long time, uh, that has allowed Taiwanese companies to grow huge as investors in China. Um, uh, but uh, they have retained some of the uh, quite opaque structures that uh, they set out uh, using uh, in the late 1980s and early 1990s. So the main growth period for Taiwanese, um, uh, for the development of Taiwanese trade and investment um, uh, um, activity in uh, China uh, was in the 1990s. And, and this, uh, of course, um, I, I have to mention, much of this happened through Hong Kong. So in the um, 1990s, when many uh, Taiwanese manufacturers relocated the production of uh, partly lower end, more labor intensive products to places such as Dongguan in, in uh, southern China, and uh, then the 2000s when some of the um, electronics industry, the downstream electronics industry followed. So companies like uh, Honghai, better known as, as Foxconn in the West, uh, Asus Tech, um, Quanta and Compile, the world's largest manufacturers of, of notebooks, computers uh, at the time, they followed. And uh, finally, also companies like, like AU Optronics, then Taiwan's leading manufacturer of LCD panels, uh, they also started opening assembly plants uh, in China. Uh, that investment boom, which actually led to uh, hollowing out part of Taiwan's manufacturing sector, um, it made Taiwanese companies some of the largest exporters and employers and, and corporate taxpayers in China. But uh, to get back to my key point about the difficulty in accurately gorging economic and trade relations between China, Hong Kong and Taiwan, since those early days, um, uh, many or most of the Taiwanese companies have still tried to conceal at least some of what they were doing. One key purpose was tax evasion, both in China and in Taiwan. And Hong Kong uh, has played, long played a key role in that. Um, Hong Kong has been both a transshipment center for uh, some of the components, the higher end components that um, the companies continued to produce in Taiwan and that were shipped to um, Taiwanese owned factories in China and for the finished products assembled in Taiwanese owned factories in China shipped back to Taiwan for subsequent um, transport to end markets such as the US. So um, also we've seen Hong Kong registered companies investing in mainland factories, uh, but many of the Hong Kong registered companies uh, 
uh, are owned by vehicles uh, in turn registered in tax havens such as the Cayman Islands or the British Virgin Islands, which again in turn are owned by Taiwanese investors. So uh, that means that any trade and investment data relating to this triangle has to be taken with a grain of salt. Now, having laid out that uh, basic caveat, uh, let's look at uh, what's going on right now. Uh, Taiwan was, um, over the last couple of years, Taiwan was Hong Kong's second largest trading partner, I think last year and the year before that, while Hong Kong ranked fourth or fifth uh, um, among um, Taiwan's trading partners. And uh, bilateral trade grew by a whopping 37% last year, according to Hong Kong trade statistics. Um, the difference uh, between Hong Kong and Taiwan trade statistics is due to issues such as foreign exchange calculation. But um, in, according to Taiwan statistics, the growth rate was uh, a little bit lower. So why are we seeing such brisk growth in trade at a time when we're assuming that bilateral exchanges between Hong Kong and Taiwan are receding? Political risk is increasing and Taiwanese investors are maybe retreating from China. First of all, 97% uh, of Hong Kong exports to Taiwan are re-exports um, from China. This is, as I already said, uh, Hong Kong is traditionally a transshipment center between uh, Taiwan and China. Um, we can assume that the majority of those re-exports come from Taiwanese-owned manufacturing facilities in China. I guess that would raise even more questions. Uh, relations between Taiwan and China have been in a precipitous decline for years now. Taiwan's government has embarked on a new southbound policy to encourage companies to consider building ties with markets such as India and Southeast Asian countries and reduce their over-dependence economically on, on China. So why are imports from China via Hong Kong on the rise? This is actually more logical than uh, many might assume. Let's consider a number of trends that are at play here uh, in recent years. So first, the investment environment as um, in China, as Richard mentioned already, um, has been deteriorating. And this has been underway for at least a decade. I was based in Beijing between um, 2008 and uh, uh, 2013. And um, I remember that uh, before 2010, I was vid visiting um, uh, hubs of Taiwanese investment in China, such as Kunshan, uh, close to uh, Shanghai, but also uh, places around Shenzhen. And companies were, most of the companies were complaining how labor costs were um, rising, environmental standards had become stricter. Uh, many uh, local governments in China that had been luring these companies there with with um, uh, investment incentives in the first place were no longer offering these incentives at all. And then, of course, the competition from Chinese manufacturers um, has gotten a lot stiffer. And um, these uh, Chinese or local companies are often uh, being prioritized or give, given benefits over uh, foreign ones, including uh, Taiwanese ones. Um, so the result of what this uh, change in the investment environment uh, was, of course, that Taiwanese companies, many of which compete on price with slim margins, uh, started relocating. So many of them to Southeast Asia. The second trend um, has been that government programs back home in, here in Taiwan um, for attracting investment uh, did lure some Taiwanese companies back home. Over the past three years, there has been a steep rise in new investment uh, by Taiwanese firms that had originally been active uh, in China. Mostly, uh, the new investment has mostly gone to central and southern Taiwan. And uh, third, as China-US relations soured, a growing number uh, of US customers of Taiwanese electronics hardware manufacturers have been demanding that uh, production of some items, especially like sensitive items like telecoms um, and, and uh, data center servers and something like that be moved uh, away from China. Um, yeah, some of these customers are companies like Google, for example, who have been, been uh, buying um, some of the hardware for their data centers from, from Taiwanese companies. Uh, so some of these production lines that used to be based in China have moved back to Taiwan. Other, others have moved to uh, Mexico or the U.S. 
And, and fourth, uh, the US-China trade war um, also then made it really necessary for a larger number of Taiwanese manufacturers uh, to move certain production out of China because they would just, with the, with the tariffs, would just not be competitive anymore. Uh, so the increase in imports uh, um, to Taiwan from China through Hong Kong reflects the fact that a larger share of the overall manufacturing pie has returned to Taiwan, and especially in the hardware technology industry, which is really, really dominant in Taiwan's external trade overall. So in the past, we would have seen um, uh, the export of certain highly specialized, more high-end components from Taiwan to China for assembly in Taiwanese-owned factories there. But now, because China has been the world's workshop for so long, it's the only country on the face of the earth that has a large enough scale in terms of the, the workforce. Um, also, Chinese companies have grown into serious players in their own right and have become key suppliers. A lot of the components made in China now need to be imported to Taiwan uh, before the end product is shipped elsewhere. So this is, of course, and, and a lot of that trade uh, goes through Hong Kong. So that's what we're seeing in, this, in that steep rise in, in um, uh, export numbers from Hong Kong to Taiwan. This is, of course, unlikely uh, to be the end of the story. There is a lot of lower end production, which uh, Taiwanese owned production, um, which is set to move from China to Southeast Asia. And um, a number of Taiwanese electronics manufacturers have big plans for scaling up product, uh, production there. Um, but this uh, has been held up by the pandemic. We um, have seen uh, countless examples where uh, um, factories, like, including companies, big companies like Foxconn, uh, have announced uh, plans for factories in Vietnam, but the actual uh, share of um, China in their uh, global supply chain or in their global uh, production hasn't really dropped as fast as expected. So um, China's zero COVID model has allowed Chinese industry to resume normal operations pretty quickly uh, ever since they had the, the initial uh, disruption of, of uh, factory activity in early 2020. And um, so after that, uh, the country has been enjoying an advantage over a number of other production locations. For example, in, in uh, Vietnam, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, and in India, we've all seen a uh, large-scale disruption of, of uh, manufacturing um, uh, because of COVID, but uh, much less so in China. Um, so, yeah, all these, uh, all these locations have suffered a series of uh, lockdowns because of infection clusters. So once the planned shift of more production from China to Southeast Asia takes place, we will very likely also see uh, shifting patterns of trade between China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. Well, that may actually be two or three years down the road. So that uh, shift may involve a reduction of Taiwanese imports from Hong Kong of products that are actually from China. Um, beyond that, we will probably also see a gradual drawdown of you know, Taiwanese corporate offices in Hong Kong, because fewer Taiwanese companies have such massive operations in China that they want to manage them uh, through Hong Kong. The other big economic component um, in, in, that is uh, quite significant in relations between uh, uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong is um, financial services. So uh, many affluent Taiwanese and, and family offices have long relied on Hong Kong for investments that are either not available or, or um, not legal in, in Taiwan. Now, uh, one of the really interesting questions uh, ahead will be to what extent uh, Taiwanese will be troubled or are, are troubled by the, um, the backsliding in Hong Kong um, in the rule of law when it comes to deciding whether to put some of their wealth in Hong Kong. Um, so far, there's still a, a sizable uh, chunk of, of um, uh, individual or, or family wealth and also of corporate um, investment portfolios that uh, is being managed in Hong Kong. Now, what, uh, what impact, if any, will uh, all of that have on politics? 
Um, so the trade and investment trends I've outlined, apart from those, there's one other very interesting economic trend in play, which I think may also have a sizable impact on how Taiwanese uh, view Hong Kong in the future. And um, I think that has to do with the, with the pandemic and the fact that Taiwan has managed the pandemic so well. Um, so uh, due to the early and decisive border controls we've seen in, in Taiwan that managed to basically uh, keep the coronavirus out of the country and prevent community spread or large scale community spread, um, that uh, in turn allowed to uh, allow the government here to avoid lockdowns and together with uh, the electronics export boom that led to uh, two years of pretty brisk economic growth uh, at a time when most of the rest of the world suffered deep recessions. So as a result, finally, we're seeing Taiwan's per capita GDP uh, catching up with the other um, three of what was used to be called the, the four little tigers. Um, I remember uh, during my first posting in Taiwan, uh, well, about 15 years ago, that uh, many people were um, frequently complaining that how Taiwan had fallen back economically behind South Korea, uh, behind Singapore, and of course behind Hong Kong, and would uh, uh, say that um, in terms of economic development, uh, Taiwan was no longer um, on par with them. And, uh, I think that kind of comparison is now uh, we, we're seeing um, uh, gradually a kind of a shift or a turnaround in that trend. And talking to people here now, my impression is that, um, th yeah, the, the sense that Taiwan somehow lags behind or is inferior economically, uh, especially to, to Hong Kong, uh, is changing. And we, we have a growing number of people who, who view uh, uh, Taiwan as a, as an economically advantageous uh, uh, location, uh, yeah, view it quite different, differently. And if you add to that the inflow of many affluent uh, Taiwanese who normally work abroad uh, during the pandemic, including people who used to be working in Hong Kong, uh, and add to that the most recent situation where Hong Kong appears to be overwhelmed by the virus, um, I think this might be, um, uh, th this might uh, um, be having an effect where uh, people look at Hong Kong in a way that that uh, they view Hong Kong as less attractive in comparison to Taiwan, not only in terms of human rights and democracy, but also uh, in terms of uh, the economy and financial matters. So let let me leave it there for the moment, and and I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Well, Catherine, well, I, I mean, you're right. I think we gave you the hardest task, but I think you did it fantastically. And obviously, it's not easy to, you know, to crunch all those numbers and and extrapolate from that and 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 try to make sense of what that means on the, on the on the political front. And I think you did a a great job and gave us a lot of uh, of material to to try to unpack going forward to try to really try to understand, um, you know, this both uh, the economic strategy that Beijing employs, but also how that interplays with. Uh, both uh, the triangular economic relations, but broader regional economic issues that um, that 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 I think will uh, come into play in terms of how the politics of these um, developments will will, will shape. Um, I want to turn it over now to um, uh, Ray Ren Wu, um, you know, to really give us the um, the the perspectives on the ground uh, there uh, in in Taiwan, and obviously, you know, Taiwan. You know, isn't it passive player uh, in uh, this? Um, you know, in 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 this sort of trilat trilateral um, uh, relationship, and so um, really want to. I'm really pleased to be able to feature uh, his perspectives here on on this panel. Uh, Ray Ren, over to you. Still can't hear sorry. you. I'm there sorry. You. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you, Russell. And good morning, everyone. Or should I say, good evening, everyone? And this is Ray Ren Wu speaking from Taipei. Uh, it's a great honor to be part of this event and learn from uh, our distinguished panel uh, panelists. Russell asked me to talk about the Taiwanese government's Hong Kong policy. I wasn't sure whether he was like a rhetorical or he really meant it. Okay. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I will be, you know, I will, you know, fulfill my duty loyally. Okay. 
but I'm not sure whether I am the right person to talk about this topic since I'm not in the government and thus know very little about their the decision making process. Still, I have been involved in some local efforts to support Hong Kong democratic movement, including some uh, rescue missions uh, during the past two and a half years. So I will share with you uh, some of my personal observations as a member of uh, Taiwanese civil society uh, of what the Taiwanese government, I mean the DPP government, of course, has been doing about Hong Kong during all this time. My observations must be incomplete, but I will try uh, my best to be objective and fair. Of one final note before I begin, I won't be talking about the effect of Hong Kong's struggle against the Leviathan on the Taiwanese people uh, today, since it is rather self-evident. Uh, one country, two system, uh, uh, to borrow the world of Charles Dickens, is as dead as a doornail uh, for the Taiwanese people. Uh, Beijing's crackdown on Hong Kong and Hong Kong people's brave struggle uh, have helped stimulate a new and powerful wave of Taiwanese nationalism in recent years, and thereby consolidate the Taiwanese national identity. So you see, there's a reason why Xi Jinping is called the General Accelerator. Now I begin my overview uh, with my, an overview. Okay, in principle, uh, Tsai Ing-wen government has been supportive. Uh, indeed, quite, indeed, outspoken about its support of Hong Kong's democratic movement. Since the events of the summer of 19, uh, 2019 in Hong Kong apparently contributed much uh, to Tsai's landslide victory in early 2020. But what it actually did, I mean, the government actually did has been rather limited due to the constraint of, among others, two main factors. The first is uh, the existing ROC system. And also the second is Taiwan's relatively fragile international situation. Uh, let me begin with the first constraint, the ROC system of Taiwan. Inasmuch as Tsai Ing-wen has chosen to stick to Li Denghui's line and inherit the ROC system, or rather to appropriate the ROC system for Taiwan, instead of building a new constitutional system, she can only pursue a Hong Kong policy within the ROC constitutional framework. According to the ROC constitution, Constitution, Hong Kong and Macau are still parts of the ROC national territories, and they and their residents are still ROC nationals. To support the Hong Kong's uh, democratic movement, whether by rescuing protesters in danger or by accepting immigrants, the Chinese government cannot directly adopt the kind of asylum and immigration mechanisms commonly practiced by democratic uh, countries nowadays, since they are essentially designed for state-to-state -state relationship. Rather, the Taiwanese government must go by a special law under the ROC constitution, uh, which is called Laws and Regulations Regarding Hong Kong and Macau Affairs, uh, which is something like the Taiwanese version of the Hong Kong Policy Act of the United States. The problem, however, is that this special law was never designed for rescuing and accepting large number of refugees and politically motivated immigrants. There was no uh, well-defined and practicable mechanisms for this kind of thorny problem in the special law. Article 18, the only part related to humanitarian purpose is now only is not only very vague, but also, but also sets up an extremely high threshold for accepting refugees and immigrants. Legally, therefore, Taiwanese government was ill-prepared, if not totally unprepared, to face the Hong Kong crisis when it broke out in June uh, 2019. The second constraint is Taiwan's international situation. The relatively fragile international situation of Taiwan, especially uh, the overwhelming pressure from China's mounting threat of invasion prompted uh, the Taiwanese government to take a more low profile and sometimes even secretive mode of actions to help Hong Kong's democratic movement. Lest Taiwan be labeled a base for anti-China Hong Kongers, which might give Beijing an excuse to, to retaliate or even to take aggressive actions against Taiwan. As a matter of fact, uh, a big part of what the Taiwanese government has done for, Thai for Hong Kong, especially those related to rescuing dissidents and protesters, can be categorized as 
呃 doable but not sayable， 可以说哦不可以做，可以做不可以说。Moreover， the Chinese government has been rather conservative or、uh, prudent， if you will， when it comes to accepting more high profile or more politically sensitive distance from Hong Kong。Uh, they would be sent to a third country, often the U.S., within a short time, even if some of them should be accepted into Taiwan. The other negative influence brought,、uh, brought about by the increasingly stronger in,、uh, pressure from China is that the Taiwanese government began to tighten up political review process of immigrants from Hong Kong. I will talk about that in detail later. Bound by the outdated ROC legal system and constrained by international politics, the Taiwanese government has done a lot less than it professed in words for Hong Kong. I'm sorry to say this, but this is what I think. This is not an accusation, but an observation of the hard realities as we have been experiencing in Taiwan. Be that as it may, the Taiwanese government or some honest and sincere bureaucrats in the, the government. Has been trying very hard to help Hong Kong despite the severe constraints. Let me give a brief account of what I know about Taiwan Taiwanese government's efforts to help the、uh, Hong Kong's democratic movement during the past two and a half years. I shall focus on the two areas where the Taiwanese government worked the hardest:、uh, the rescuing and accommodating of protesters and dissidents, and secondly, immigration policy.、Uh, Let me begin with the second、uh, part, which is the rescue, the rescue effort before the outbreak of COVID-19.、Uh, that is、uh, the rescue effort during the summer of、uh, between the summer of 19,、uh, 2019 and the February of 2020. Apparently, the Taiwanese government had been unprepared for the sudden coming of pro,、uh, political crisis in Hong Kong and Taiwan's role in the crisis. In, in the crisis. It was not until the arrival of the first wave of protesters fleeing from Hong Kong police manhunt to seek refuge in Taiwan during the summer of 2019 that the Taiwanese government began to realize very slowly the the gravity of Hong Kong problem and its response and its responsibility. I mean, the Taiwanese government's responsibility. But it came, but the government came to this realization not by itself. But under the pressure of the civil societies of both Taiwan and Hong Kong, the first wave of protesters came to Taiwan to seek refuge right after the occupation of a legislative council on July the first, twenty nineteen. Although there were about、uh, well, it's it's an informal statistic about two、uh, hundred of them, or maybe a little bit more. Uh, mostly youngsters in their twenties,、uh, many of them were college students and even some teenage high school students. Some came and left.、Uh, some came and, and and returned to Hong Kong, and some came and went,、uh, left for Hong Kong,、uh, left for for instance UK or some other places. And eventually, about one hundred and fifty or so decided to stay and seek asylum in Taiwan. They became the first cause of headache,、uh, brought about. Uh, by the Hong Kong crisis for the unprepared Taiwanese government, these young protesters came with、uh, to tourist visas in great haste, without any plan, and had to fend for themselves after arriving in Taiwan. In other words, the situation could turn into some kind of a small-scale humanitarian crisis, crisis if left、uh, unintervened. It was not until late August uh, of uh, 2019 that. Uh, MAC Mac, uh, Minister, uh, Mainland Affairs Committee Lu Weihui of the Taiwanese government, prompted by civic groups from both Taiwan and Hong Kong, held a three-party meeting to establish the first mechanism for systematically helping these young protesters in plight. In short, the, it was a temporary、uh, support and ac accommodation program, which is. Which, in theory, could lead to permanent residence and even naturalization in Taiwan, but in fact, it takes a very long waiting period.、Uh, it should be noted that these refugees, even when accepted into the program,、uh, do not enjoy the status of asylum seekers,、uh, since legally there is no asylum system in Taiwan. There is no asylum system in Taiwan. Uh, more importantly, the program was unofficial to be operated by Taiwan's civic、uh, civic groups. 
It was not until July 2020, after the promulgation of the Hong Kong's national security law, that the program was transferred to a newly established Taiwan Hong Kong Service and Exchange Office. But the moment the, the program became official, it lost its original function since there were very few uh, new protests allowed to enter Taiwan at this stage due to the COVID-19 uh, border control. What the office does now is mostly to take care of this uh, early group of young refugees who came before the outbreak of COVID-19 and perhaps to answer some phones. And okay. Okay, let me turn to uh, read the section on the rescue after the outbreak. After the outbreak of COVID-19, the protesters and dissidents from Hong Kong were no longer able to enter Taiwan freely with tourist visa, as the first group did due to the travel ban. From this moment on until now, only very limited special cases of protesters and dissidents were allowed to enter Taiwan. Most of them came to Taiwan through the mediation of local individuals civil groups or political parties. More specifically, the process goes like this. First, the protesters or dissidents would contact individuals or groups or political parties in Taiwan from Hong Kong or other places. And second step, local contacts would then transfer the cases to the Taiwanese government as sponsors and guarantors. And the third step, the government would review the cases and make decisions. And as far as I know, personally know, uh, these cases have been reviewed and decided by officials of the top level of the Taiwanese government. Uh, it is rumored that it, it has been decided by Guanghui National Security Council. So, uh, so the Taiwanese government took this kind of case very seriously. Those who were approved will be issued a special visa on humanitarian grounds and enter Taiwan. Those who came as a special humanitarian cases were usually politically more sensitive compared to the first wave of young protesters. So they surely belong to the doable but not saleable category. After they entered Taiwan, they were usually placed in the rescue pro program I just mentioned, and they would be asked by the government to keep a, a low profile, if not totally quiet in Taiwan. Many chose to settle down in Taiwan and enter the long winding immigration process, but a few cases were completely kept secret from the public and transferred to another country as soon as possible when judged necessary by the government. I have no official statistics of this kind of special humanitarian cases, but I would guess the number is rather low, maybe between 50 to 100, only for very selected few individuals. Uh, okay, now next is the part of immigration policy. Compared to its conservative attitude toward asylum seekers from Hong Kong, the Taiwanese government has been more active in accepting Hong Kong immigrants, apparently because a common a commonplace practice such as immigration is less conspicuous and therefore less uh, politically risky than accepting political dissidents. The deepening of Hong Kong crisis, especially the promulgation of national security law on June 30, 2020, prompted the Taiwanese government to adjust immigration policy toward Hong Kong residents. Basically, the government has been trying to balance two mutually conflicting goals uh, to accommodate freedom-loving and preferably middle-class professional Hong Kong immigrants on the one hand and to prevent the infiltration of pro-communist elements on the other. The outcome was a combination of measures with various aims. First, tightening up investment in uh, immigration. So now you want to, you know, to immigrate to Taiwan by way of investment, you'll be more and more difficult. Secondly, loosening immigration of professionals. And thirdly, strengthening political review pertaining to applicants' China connection. Those who have served in the disciplinary forces of Hong Kong government are rejected outright as suspected uh, perpetrators of state violence against uh, the protesters. But those who had taken an oath of loyalty to the national security law, even under pressure while serving in other sections of Hong Kong government, have been regarded as suspected of communi uh, communist uh, sympathies by the Immigration Office of Taiwan. Another policy related to the immigration was the loosening of regulation that allowed more college and graduate students from Hong Kong to come and study in, Hong Kong, in Taiwan and to work after graduation and eventually to naturalize locally. During 2020 and the 20, uh, 21, 
more than 5,000 Hong Kong students apply for Taiwan's university each year, about 44% increase compared to that of uh, 2019. And among these applicants, roughly uh, 3,000 or more each year were admitted to a school. This is a, it's a 90% increase uh, compared to the previous year. The number of Hong Kong students enrolled in Taiwan's institutions of higher learning has now reached to over uh, 10,000 in total. According to Ming Bao, uh, the renowned liberal media in Hong Kong, uh, by 2020, Taiwan has become the number one choice for Hong Kong students to study abroad. Uh, apparently, this is part of Taiwanese government's overall policy to attract potential middle class professionals from Hong Kong to Taiwan. Now, let me conclude. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, can I finish my? Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, let me conclude. Uh, as a whole, the Taiwanese government has been searching for effective ways to help Hong Kong's democratic movement and activists under the guidance. Uh, if not constrained, of two paramount political principles. First, to stick to the existing uh, ROC constitutional system, and secondly, to protect national security of Taiwan. In addition, the government had to work under the severe uh, constraint created by the disastrous COVID-19. The outcome is a friendly but somewhat conservative or prudent, if you will, Hong Kong policy. The Taiwanese government spoke up public for Taiwan's, uh, for Hong Kong's anti-extradition extradition bill movement when the movement was uh, still going on very lively, but it never joined with the US and UK uh, in sanctioning Chinese and, and Hong Kong officials. Unlike, you know, you know, we know that the, uh, the most recent news is that Taiwan has joined the US in sanctioning uh, Russia, right? But this is, but Taiwan adopted a very different uh, policy toward Hong Kong in the Hong Kong case. And under the pressure of uh, from civil societies in Taiwan and Hong Kong after the first wave of asylum seekers arrived, the, Hong, the, the government participated in the joint effort of rescue mission, but unofficially and informally within the crevices of existing ROC laws and refusing to create formal asylum uh, mechanism. They still do. They still refuse to, to create formal asylum system, uh, uh, mechanism. After the outbreak of COVID-19, the government created a new channel for bringing in limited humanitarian cases, but blocked the escape route of many ordinary protests through travel ban. In total, Taiwanese government has by now been able to help and shelter about 20, 200, uh, 200 to 300 Hong Kong protesters and dissidents through this quasi-asylum system. This is really very few compared to what uh, the UK or US has done for uh, in this respect. The government put a lot more efforts in accepting Hong Kong immigrants through close screening and monitoring processes, and also through accepting more Hong Kong students. Only during uh, 2021, uh, 11,173 aspiring Hong Kong immigrants receiving resident permit of Taiwan. This is a 3% increase compared to that of 2020. And uh, in the same year, uh, 1,685 uh, 1, Hong Kongers were naturalized as Taiwanese citizens. This is 7% uh, percent increase compared to that of 2020. Despite Taiwanese government's cautious monitoring, the number of Hong Kong immigrants to Taiwan is expected to continue to grow in the coming years. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, a very large Hong Kong diaspora community in Taiwan is, inform is information. All in all, the picture of Taiwanese government's Hong Kong policy since 2019 that I painted here can be summarized as a support Hong Kong with provisos or caveats. What are the provisos or caveats? There are three of them. The first provisos to depoliticize the Hong Kong issue by reducing the number of politically sensitive asylum seekers Second, to ensure national security by, avo by avoiding directly pro provoking Beijing and by screening our immigrants with dubious loyalties. And thirdly, to look beyond uh, Hong Kong uh, and look ahead of current crisis by absorbing present and future middle class professionals from Hong Kong into Taiwan's citizenry. In other words, to turn Hong Kong rescue mission into a nation building project for Taiwan. 
okay? Desperate to balance between democracy and security, international and nationalism ideal and reality. Taiwan's Hong Kong policy indeed reminds one of a small state trying hard to navigate between the dire straits between empires. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for occupying too much time. Thank you so much, Ray Ren. I mean, I think there's a, you pack a lot of insights uh, in there, a lot of um, important data points uh, that, you know, um, that I don't think we all have enough time to really pull on and, and discuss at length in, 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 in our discussion today. But I, I do think that, you know, your, your laying out of the constraints of Taiwan's um, policy towards uh, Hong Kong as one that is, you know, both constitutional and legal um you know i think provides a framework that um i think has largely been missed in a lot of discussions with regards to uh what are the limiting limiting factors to why uh you know taiwan has i think as you described it you know in terms of you know speaking out very you know loudly at least in the support of 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 taiwan of hong kong uh, but yet constrained in many ways in terms of how it has responded and i think you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what you're saying here is that, you know, what Taiwan has done so far has been necessary, but insufficient in your view, uh, in, in, in what, um, you know, what could be done with regards to, 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 to the, uh, ongoing situation in Hong Kong. Um, I got one, I remind our, our, our audience, excuse me, <clears throat> audience members, uh, that we, we, we do want to hear from you. And, and I see that we have received several good questions here already. And um, uh, but I, I want to and so you can do so by uh, sending an email to uh, contact at globaltaiwan.org or use the chat function on our YouTube page. Again, those uh, you know, please include your name as well as your affiliation. Those that do will be prioritized in uh, the um, in when we get to that section of our, of today's event. Um, I want to exercise the uh, moderator's prerogative here and and first of all uh, pose a question to to Dennis. You know, I think. You've heard here, all, you know, through uh, these um, discussion already from the presentations about, you know, U.S. policy, Taiwan's approach, uh, you know, sort of the economic dynamics here, and and from your view, obviously, as someone who is, um, uh, who ha who has lived through it, who's been through it, who's experienced it firsthand, um, you know, what are are the things that you think the United States and and also Taiwan, for that matter, that you know, can do in your view? Uh, as someone who's also a legal professional, as well as a scholar on these issues, better assist uh, with the ongoing situation in, in, in Hong Kong? That is I think the most immediate result uh, as you see the fallout and the uh, breakup of one country, two system is that a lot of Hong Kong people want to leave Hong Kong, especially those uh, who are uh, in a better economic position, uh, the middle class professionals, the nurses, the doctors, the finance and legal professionals, um, the teachers, they are all leaving Hong Kong. I think the latest statistics is that um, uh, roughly 90,000 people have applied for the BNO, um, the British uh, 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 visa to uh, resettle in the UK. Um, on the human level, um, every week uh, before the lockdown, you see that every time there's a flight to uh, London Heathrow, um, you see families um, uh, saying goodbye to, you know, maybe one family leaving. Obviously, these people are going for a long time um, because when, when one family leaves, all their friends and uh, 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 families, they turn up, uh, including the local pastor, praying over them. You know, th those are the scenes that we're seeing um, in Hong Kong. It is as if, um, you know, when I, when I was growing up in Hong Kong in the 90s, uh, one in perhaps three family in the class would be uh, uh, emigrating. Um, but this time it is um, not done as an insurance policy. This time people are leaving uh, as if they are trying to escape um, authoritarianism. Um, so, so it is there's this great sense of urgency among amongst Hong Kong people, um, both based on statistics and anecdotal evidence uh, of you know people telling me that they are either uh, either they have already left or that um, they are planning to do so. So going forward, I I would. Um, um, estimate that at least half a million Hong Kong people will be leaving. Now, Hong Kong people are resourceful. Um, they bring with them their uh, entrepreneur spirit, uh, their willingness to work, and of course, um, you know, Hong Kong people are, are resourceful. 
uh, they bring with them their capital as well. I think uh, countries around the world should welcome Hong Kong people with open arms, including Taiwan. Now, I understand uh, 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 Dr. Wu, uh, you know, explanation of the concerns of the Taiwanese authorities um, that there will be a kind of infiltration um, uh, amongst the Hong Kong people who emigrate to Taiwan who could turn out to be CCP agents. Um, that is a real concern, but I don't think we should let that concern uh, hold back uh, our efforts in welcoming Hong Kong people to resettle um, in Taiwan, in the United States, uh, uh, Canada, Australia, and the UK. Um, I, I think that um, if you look at the policy of Canada, Australia, and the UK, it actually um, uh, kind of show how little Taiwan and US has done to help Hong Kong people resettle. Those countries have been very generous uh, in welcoming Hong Kong uh, with their policy, actual policies in place, uh, uh, including Canada and Australia. Uh, but the US, I mean, um, has done very little so far in uh, uh, helping Hong Kong people. There are, there are several bills in Congress, uh, including the one that passed by House just now, uh, uh, just uh, a month ago, the America Competes Act, which contains provisions uh, welcoming Hong Kong people to resettle in the US, but they are still not, um, they're still stuck in the Senate, um, uh, not being uh, passed. So I, I think I think those are the kind of measures that Hong Kong people would welcome um, uh, as they look for options abroad. Richard, I, I want to turn it to you in terms of maybe reacting a bit on, on Dennis's comments there in terms of what may be feasible from a US policies perspective and also broaden that out a little bit in terms of what, you know, your view in terms of someone who's, you know, studied obviously uh, Hong Kong very well closely and watch and in practitioner policy. But, but, you know, maybe comment also a bit about where you see Hong Kong fitting within Washington's overall diplomacy uh, towards Beijing and, and how does, and just weaving in here now, the, 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 the fact that we are, you know, addressing the, the implications for Taiwan as well. How does Taiwan factor in that overall diplomacy between Washington and Beijing on, on Hong Kong issues? How does Hong Kong factor in or how does Taiwan yeah. factor in? How does Taiwan factor in? Okay. Uh, in yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. Well, um, when the PRC talks to us about Taiwan, when they raise the issue, it's usually about arms sales. And, but there have been times in the past, not the Trump administration, but, but other times when US presidents have said, to um, Chinese leaders, it's not our arms sales that are blocking you from achieving your political objectives vis-a-vis uh, -vis Taiwan. It is uh, your own policies and the total unpopularity of one country, two systems in Taiwan and the fundamental fact that Taiwan's a democracy. The Taiwan people will decide whether to go in the direction you wanna go. Um, and I think that's a good line of argument, actually. And in making that argument, one could put forward as the, the primary piece of evidence what's happened in Hong Kong. Our diplomats can say, how can you possibly expect Taiwan people to consider anything close to your one country, two systems offer after you've trashed your own formula in Hong Kong. What's there to trust? Uh, and so I think um, Hong Kong is actually a very good talking point uh, in dealing with China when it comes to Taiwan. Could you respond a bit to what Dennis had raised about, you know, um, you know, his view that, you know, the United States has done um, relatively less compared to, say, Canada and Australia with regards to asylum, where you see that sort of why, why that is the case um, and, and what, you know, where, where the U.S. stand, where do you think the U.S. should stand on this issue? Um, I think there, uh, well, first of all, I think it is to the U.S. advantage to um, um, sort of make exceptions in our immigration law to allow um, Hong Kong people special preference to come. Um, these are really smart people. They can contribute to our economy. Uh, a lot of them are in STEM fields and, uh, and they're not PRC Chinese. 
Um, so they have that going for them. Now, I um, I want to remind everybody that in 2019, 2020, when uh, the the bad times really hit Hong Kong, and you might have expected a more liberal immigration policy, uh, we had people at the top of the Trump administration who wanted uh, to block in every way possible, making it easier for foreigners to come to the United States. Um, I won't name names, but you know who I'm talking about. Since then, um, you know, the Biden administration has had a whole lot of crises that it has had to face. And uh, the federal government has been depleted in its capability um, for a variety of reasons. But um, I think it is not out of the realm of possibility that the executive branch on its own, um, without uh, um, urging from Congress, uh, could make um, adjustments um, in our um, in our rules to give preference to Hong Kong people. And in fact, uh, the executive branch might make those changes just to head off the congressional legislation. Interesting. Um, Catherine, uh, you know, what struck me while you were, you know, going through your presentation and, and, and really uh, was that, you know, there's a lot of levers that, you know, that actually Taiwan has. And perhaps when you get into a more granular level, level, it, you know, there, there are probably different uh, differences between how, you know, the structure of the trade relations and economic relations with 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 um, with with Hong Kong and China for Taiwan as um, is, is is somewhat different because of the indirect nature of it and the transshipment um, aspect of it. But I was wondering if you, you know, if you get a sense, uh, you know, since you're based in Taipei now, um, you know, what the um, what is the sense of the business community in Taiwan uh, with, uh, you know, their concerns with uh, with the events in Hong Kong and how that might impact uh, its relations uh, with with China, you know, do do you have the sense that perhaps what's happening in Hong, Kong, what we see at least in, in from the from the Amtran Hong Kong report that you know there seems to be a great deal of concern and people are considering leaving and and companies, how is that how how are events in Hong Kong affecting the business community in Ta the, the the broader business community in Taiwan as as uh, in, uh, in from your view. Uh, I think if we're looking at at um, the Taiwanese corporate landscape, um, the number one priority for many companies is still figuring out what to do uh, with their in the future um, in in China. I mean, Hong Kong is clearly not as doesn't feature as prominently in their considerations as uh, as China itself, and and uh, since they're so. Uh, such big changes afoot in in their in the structure of of their manufacturing footprint and their their global footprint overall, um, that's kind of has priority. But once they uh, they do move um, some of their um, uh, mainland presence, that may well have an impact on uh, what they're doing in in Hong Kong. And if you're talking about the broader business community in Taiwan, I guess that also Im includes. Uh, foreign businesses, and and if we're talking about the the foreign business community here, many of many executives and, and many companies have long had um, people who were in charge of uh, Taiwan alongside other greater China activities, and and who've been um, uh, shuttling back and forth between uh, uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong, and they clearly can't do that anymore because of the um, the COVID situation. And um, these people uh, are all absolutely alarmed about what's uh, going on in Hong Kong. I mean, the the, the backsliding regarding the the rule of law, and um, that is uh, th there's a large amount of of um, uh, huge concern there. And um, I I know of a quite sizable sizable number of people who uh, used to spend more of their time in Hong Kong and now uh, are basically uh, mainly based in in, in Taiwan. But that's that's more uh, foreign executives. I mean, the, the, the Taiwanese business people I've spoken to tend to be a bit more, uh, well, more, still more profit oriented and, and um, uh, have a lot of uh, strategic patience about putting like putting up with lack of uh, rule of law and, and uh, um, 
well, many of them are very willing to give it more time and to wait a little bit longer uh, mm. to see what happens further in Hong Kong. Right, right. I, I see you nodding your head there, and it seems like you're in agreement with this. But I was wondering if whether or not another constraint in terms of Taiwan's approach to Hong Kong has been, you know, perhaps, you know, uh, you know, uh, efforts by the business community in Taiwan to basically not take a stronger response to events in Hong Kong for concerns, perhaps, of hurting their, you know, bottom line. Um, you know, obviously, that's a that's a common concern in any, you know, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of countries. Uh, but I wonder if, to what extent, you, you your sense of there uh, in Taipei of of that being a, a potential um, constraint there. Oh, uh, your your audio is uh, is muted right now. Mm -hmm. This is the part that I omitted from my uh, my notes. You see, you know, I I wrote about it, but I, I didn't. I thought that I didn't have not enough time. But I'm I'm not a uh, specialist in political economy, but I fully agree with Catherine's observation. Very kind and sharp observation that Taiwanese businessmen tend to put you know uh, to be more profit minded, and they tend to be more patient. About uh, about uh, the lack of rule of law and democracy, and I think they are still waiting and seeing. There, it's kind of a wait and see attitude toward what might be changing in China. I think. So you see, and so I, I believe I agree, and I believe that you know this kind of uh, uh, reluctance on the part of Taiwanese business uh, community uh, to to take drastic action or to liberal attitude toward Hong Kong. Creates a very ser serious uh, obstacle for the Thai uh, government to uh, to change its policy. Yeah, basically, this is my attitude, my observation. I'm not sorry. I'm not a political economist, but I do agree with uh, the ob observation of uh, Catherine. Uh, yeah. uh, with, with the other panel's permission, I want to extend um, you know a bit uh, our session today, maybe around five minutes, if that's okay. If you have to drop off, uh, just let you know. To let me know, you can. You know, wave goodbye. But I know that you know our presentations went on a little longer than I had anticipated. And I do want to get to some of the questions that we received from our audience members. And you know, with only about four minutes remaining from our uh, our original close time, I, I'd like to just extend it by a little bit, just so I can get a, a few more questions in uh, from from uh, from 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 this uh, really uh, excellent panel discussion. And one, I'm just going to take one last question here, and this is much more on a factual matter that has, I think, perhaps longer political implications. And I'm not sure whether or not anyone has any updates as to as to what the figures are and, what, and, and has a sense in terms of where this trend is going. But uh, I pulled this out of your book, actually, Richard. Um, uh, so uh, I don't know if you have any updates on this, but in 2016, you noted how that according to a census done that was there in Hong Kong, that 60% of the persons were born in Hong Kong. Uh, another 32 to 33% were uh, you know, from, uh, from the mainland, Taiwan and Macau. What what are the demographic trends going forward in Hong Kong, and, and in your view, and, and what are the implications of that? I think uh, in, in for the Hong Kong's uh, political system, um, Retro, maybe you have a sense in terms of where you were going with that sort of data point, and and maybe what you see as in terms of whether the trend lines in 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 the sense of uh, demographics and the political system there. Well, I don't have a crystal ball on this, uh, but it's a good question. Um, of course, back in the 50s and 60s, um, I lived in Hong Kong in the 60s. Most of the people were China born uh, because of all the refugees. Um, now, and, and then the demographic picture changed. My guess would be that you would see a decline in the share of Hong Kong born people as families who feel they can't uh, be safe in Hong Kong anymore or leaving, as Dennis so graphically and movingly described. And at the same time, you have um, mainland people coming in. Uh, there has been a rule for a long time, I don't know if it's it still exists, that um, 150 PRC people a day can come to Hong Kong permanently. Is that true still, Dennis? Um, and then there are other people who come to school and some of China's best and brightest want to go to Hong Kong U or Chinese University and uh, they see good job prospects in Hong Kong after they graduate and they're allowed to stay. So I think that uh, the share of mainland people 
who um, move to Hong Kong and um, and stay and build their families there is going to go. So I think there'll be a sh slight shift in the Hong Kong born, mainland born, have no idea how big it will be. Obviously, um, Hong Kong is not the place it was before 2019. So the attractiveness of it for mainland people in terms of lifestyle isn't going to be as nice. To supplement uh, on Richard's uh, point, um, what we know is that the government, the Hong Kong government, is planning to massively develop the new territories um, of Hong Kong into a new metropolis. And they estimate that the population size will grow to 12 million from what is around seven and a half million now to 12 million. Now, we know that the birth rates in Hong Kong have been in the decline for many years. And uh, with the exodus of Hong Kong people, what they have to fill Hong Kong with is obviously mainland people. And I, I expect the same policy you see in Tibet, in Xinjiang, in Inner Mongolia will happen in Hong Kong in that they will flush Hong Kong with mainland people in order to uh, the um, sort of um, uh, get rid of the Hong Kongers identity through that way. Uh, and uh, in a couple of years, I don't think there will be a hard border between Hong Kong and Shenzhen. You will see a part, a great part of Hong Kong that is directly administered and managed by Shenzhen. And then you will have uh, millions of uh, mainland people move to Hong Kong. That's really interesting. Thanks, Dennis. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, you know, in the interest of time, I'm going to combine the questions, some of the questions that we received from our um, from our audience members, and I'm going to present it to uh, all the panelists. They weren't specified for anyone in particular, and I'll you know, give you all a chance to respond to whichever question you'd like to uh, respond to. Uh, the first question relates to um, what sorts of policy has Taiwan government employed to attract international capital? That is in increasingly likely to leave Hong Kong and help Taiwan become more of an international financial center in Asia. That's one question. Second is how have the events in Hong Kong affected Taiwanese views on unification versus independence and or Taiwanese identification as Chinese, Taiwanese, or both Chinese and Taiwanese? So the identity question. That's the second question. Um, the third is. Are there any steps the international community could have taken in response to the national security law that would have had a discernible impact on Beijing's strategy? And fourth, does the Chinese occupation of Hong Kong make it pose a, more of a military a risk to Taiwan? Um, and I think we can broaden out to more security risk, and I think we, we kind of addressed that uh, in the in the in the discussion already. Um, and, uh, and finally, uh, studies have indicated that Beijing has had a role in spreading disinformation about the Hong Kong protests and driving wedges in Hong Kong society. Do you believe that this has had any success in affecting Taiwanese perception of Beijing's crackdown and subsequent asylum seekers? Uh, okay, so that's all the questions, um, and uh, and I'll leave it to the panelists to uh, uh, to take whichever questions that they like uh, to address, and um, and we'll bring it to a close after the uh, after all, after all of you had a chance to respond to whichever question you like. Um, well, so who I, like to go? Yeah, Richard. May I take number three about um, you know is there anything the international community could have done? Um, okay. I actually believe uh, that. There was nothing that uh, we could have done because um, the events of 2019 um, led PRC leaders to conclude that the Hong Kong government was incapable of controlling the situation uh, and that sterner measures uh, were necessary. Um, there was a fear that this was a color revolution in progress. Um, and um, you know, it didn't matter what the effect of, uh, of this would be on China's reputation. It had to be done. It's kind of like the reaction to Tiananmen. Uh, and keep in mind what I said before about Xi Jinping's uh, obsession with national security. Um, he really is a control freak. and. Um, you know, they took the steps that they felt they needed to take 
And as Dennis suggested, um, you know, the um, memory uh, of these events in the international mindset is is fading, if not already faded away. Um, and, um, uh, you know, sanctions were imposed, but uh, they were ready to, um, I think, bear the brunt of that. Yeah, I, I, I just want to add to um, the, 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 the question posed about Hong Kong's uh, status as an international financial center and whether Taiwan could kind of take over some of that uh, status. Uh, now, the key to understanding Hong Kong's financial center is that with all the, despite all the talk of patriotism, Hong Kong dollar is still pegged to the US dollar. OK, and there's a reason why it is not pegged to the renminbi if it, everyone is so patriotic then the Hong Kong dollar really should be packed to the renminbi. But it is packed to the US dollar for a very good reason, because um, uh, the US Hong Kong dollar pack is the key to Hong Kong's uh, status and as international financial center. The reason why people hold assets in Hong Kong dollars is because it is freely convertible to US dollar, the greenback, not the renminbi. Now, you try to run an international financial center uh, uh, using uh, a renminbi, uh, then you will immediately lose access to a, a lot of international capital. Now, I think um, going forward, um, is that model still sustainable? Um, I, I doubt very much um, that the Hong Kong dollar will con continue to be freely convertible. I actually predict that some form of capital restrictions that you see in the mainland uh, will be extended mm. to Hong Kong in the not so uh, distant future. Now, this is very important for financiers to think about because if uh, capital restrictions do apply to Hong Kong like they, the way they do in the mainland, then um, a lot of capital will have to find an alternative home. But I think Singapore will, will, will take the, the, the main advantages over uh, uh, Hong Kong and um, over Taiwan because Singapore already has a lot of the infrastructure and regulations in place. In fact, a lot of mainland people used to use Hong Kong as their private bank they are now moving to Singapore because they don't trust the banks there anymore and the regulatory authorities uh, there in Hong Kong. So the trend is that uh, a lot of businesses are moving to Singapore. A lot of regional headquarters are moving to Singapore. Uh, Taiwan policy thinkers need to think very hard uh, in how they they could uh, um, take advantage of this and not let Singapore win all the business. Uh Ray Ray well, Catherine. Um, I will take one and two. Okay, I will give you very simple answers. Uh, concerning the first question, you know, I don't think the Taiwanese government is is really interested in attracting the kind of international capital, you know, fleeing from Hong Kong because Taiwan's economy is kind of a is a more is is kind of a, a more complex form of national economy, which is quite different. It essentially, it's different from. The kind of economy uh, of Hong Kong or Singapore, which is focused on like single sector or financial sector, or so you see the the kind of capital that f is fleeing from Hong Kong. I think they will most likely they will go to Singapore, you know, okay, and not to Taiwan. And but you know, on the other hand, at the same time, the Taiwanese government wants to attract a different kind of capital, which is. More like industrial capital, you know, more like in in manufacturing uh, industries such as IC industries. You see, Taiwan is famous for for his and the TMSC, right? So, and it's very clearly that the Taiwanese government, the overall policy of Taiwanese economic policy now is to turn, try to turn, to slowly turn Taiwan into a, a so-called silicon island, and this is happening now in Taiwan. Okay, so I think you know this is my answer to the first question. So. Yeah, of course, I understand Danny's advice, but I think that, you know, even if Taiwan wants to, to attract those capital from you know, fleeing from Hong Kong, I think they can they cannot do it. You know? they, they can they cannot outdo, you know, Singapore because they basically the economies of two, two countries are, are, are quite different. OK, this is the first question. And the second question about this tendency of identity change in Taiwan, you know, my answer is that, you know, actually the 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 formation of a Taiwanese identity, national identity, is a long historical trend. You know, it's not, it does not happen just because of China, just because of crackdown, you know, Beijing's crackdown on Hong Kong, you see. So it is, you know, it is both external, an external and internal process, you see. 
So you have to understand that the formation and the maturity and the consolidation of a Taiwanese national identity, and above all is uh, the outcome of the formation of Taiwan as a national a nation state. So you see, it's a more, in a sense, it's outcome of uh, a long historical process of which the most crucial period was dem uh, democratization since the 90s, okay? You see, democratization actually is, is the most important, the primal uh, mot motivating or driving force behind the formation, you know, the, this rapid formation of a Taiwanese uh, national identity, okay? So I think, of course, uh, Xi Jinping accelerated the process, but without Hong Kong, Taiwan is still, uh, on the you know on the way of becoming a, a fully a full fledged uh, nation state. Okay, this is my uh, simple answer to the second question. Thank you, Catherine. With your with the last word here, yeah. maybe very uh, very briefly uh, on on also both of these questions. I I totally agree with uh, uh, Ruren that um, uh, Taiwanese identity is the um, is in the process is in a long historical. Uh, process of of uh, development. Nonetheless, I think it wouldn't hurt for uh, people who are interested uh, to take a quick look at the long running polls that have followed this development. For example, the National Agenda, um, uh, University Election Center, and those will show you both that that there has been a, this long running uh, uh, development, ever clearer formation of Taiwanese identity since those polls started in the early nineties. But it will also show you that there has been a jump in both the um, uh, um, assertion of Taiwanese identity and um, the the um, turning away from the option or, or the choice of, of mm, unification as a potential future option uh, after the latest events in Hong Kong over the over the last uh, three or four years has been been um, a, a quite drastic. Uh, acceleration in in those trends. So that that's one. And on on the uh, economic uh, question, I think um, even um, if uh, Taiwan wanted to uh, attract some of the capital that is flying uh, fleeing Hong Kong, uh, it's probably not in in its interest because it would require the kind of the amount and the kind of deregulation that runs counter to Taiwan's national security um, uh, needs. So that's that's all I wanted to add. No, thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you all to our panelists. And I, and I wanted to apologize for going um, well over time, but I think that only goes to show that there's so much more uh, that uh, we can discuss about these issues. And and you know, and I think we will do our part here at GTI to continue to to uh, provide a platform for discussions about these issues that can help better inform uh, people about, um, uh, you know, why these issues matter both, um, you know, for uh, Taiwan policy, but for the United States and for the people of Hong Kong as well. And um, and so thank you all again for uh, to our panelists and our audience members for engaging uh, in today's discussion. Uh, and uh, please stay safe and stay healthy and um, and take care, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye.